those who were behind this were doing it for the sole purpose of satisfying their own interests. <coughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I would now like to share with you our experience in Rwanda, which has had its share of challenges regarding nation building. Our history in the 30 years following independence was marked by the near absence of characteristics of a functioning state working in the interests of all its citizens. From independence in 1962 up to 1994, Rwandan governments based their legitimacy on a fundamentally flawed premise of exclusion. These governments destroyed the identity and unity on which the Rwandan nation had been founded and exclusion became institutionalized. The conditions of conflict and destruction were made possible by this type of leadership which championed division and sectarianism. Because of this fundamental deficiency, when faced with the challenges of legitimacy, this leadership fell back on their ideology they were familiar with, the so-called ethnic identities, which in effect undermined everything Rwanda was supposed to be. There were other attendant, attendant weaknesses. The politics of exclusion inevitably leads to loss of legitimacy, which meant that governance was exercised through coercion rather than consensus or consent. National resources were then diverted to keep this coercive machine in place. Corruption was used to maintain a semblance of effectiveness and the valuable resources were powered into the preferred regions where the leaders came from. A preoccupation with remaining in power and meeting the demands of a sectarian constituency did not allow for the investment of meager resources in education, technology, and business that were needed for social economic transformation. This state of affairs had two related consequences. First, the economic stagnation and levels of poverty remained high. Second, it led to heavy dependence on foreign aid that had devastating consequences on the development of the country. It led the people to believe that they could rely on perpetual handouts from donors for their livelihood and therefore need not work hard. Most of the donor funds remained in the wrong hands and to a great extent served to entrench this corrupt leadership. But equally, these funds gave donors an undue political influence in our domestic affairs. It is instructive that Rwanda's budget before 1994 was financed almost 100% by external funding. Today, external support of the national budget budget is less than 50%. 
The loss of legitimacy by post-colonial governments and the necessity to prop them up by the undemocratic means had other consequences that militated against effective nation building. Leaders were not accountable to the citizens, but rather to their foreign benefactors. It also led to increased repression and exclusion. The tragic consequence of all this was the genocide in 1994. Informed by the failure of past governments, the government of Rwanda has since 1994 approached the challenges of nation building in a different way. We have adopted and implemented policies that foster national unity, promote reconciliation, peace and security, and development. We have set out to build a nation of laws and institutions. The first step was to correct a historical wrong and dispute inclusive politics. The Rwandan people learned the hard way the danger of politics of exclusion where the winner takes all and have opted for a model that builds on inclusive politics of power sharing and consensus building. 